Okay, because there, there is a chance there might be some people that fall asleep in this, this crowd. I don't know. Yeah, the ones in the back. Yeah, Alex mine for sure, and it's probably due to my, my speaking skills, so. Um, what did you say about Mary? Yeah, uh, so, um, so yeah, I'm glad everybody's here today. I'm happy to be here as well. Uh, my name's Brian Sebade. I work for the University of Wyoming Extension. I'm based out of Laramie and cover Southeast Wyoming for agriculture and horticulture education. So um, I actually grew up in Lander and I'm, I'm happy to be back in this area. So um, unlike Rachel, who probably got an A in public speaking in college, I only, you know, received a B. So I apologize for the ums and the stuttering and everything else that might happen today. But uh, I'm happy to be here. It's been quite a while since we've actually been able to uh, teach in person, which I thoroughly enjoy and uh, am glad to not be doing this over Zoom today. So um, I appreciate everybody being here. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today um, are some poisonous plants. So I'm guessing some of you, maybe all of you, have dealt with poisonous plants at some point. Um, it's pretty interesting when we really stop and think about what plants are out there, what are actually poisonous to humans, what are poisonous to livestock, other types of animals. So a lot of today, uh, we're going to actually just talk about different plants that are out there. We're really not going to go through the signs or symptoms to look for. Uh, we're not gonna go through the amounts and different types of um, you know, poisons that are out there, what we're looking for. Um, because if we went through that, um, Chance and I, who just left, who's the host for the event today, he and I started that one time when we were up in Northeast Wyoming and three hours later, we finally got through about three quarters of our presentation. So um, what we're really going to focus on today um, are plants to look for uh, during drought situations, some management strategies to think about. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the examples I have today um, are examples from people calling me saying, hey, um, I talked to my vet, um, they think this might be happening, can you come out here and try and find this plant? So, um, so then it ends up being me um, with that landowner uh, looking for plants that are out there. So um, some of these are probably fairly common to you, some of these may not be. Um, you know, the other thing that's interesting with these drought um, situations is we might be thinking about drought in terms of July and August, but sometimes if we've had some really dry years, um, especially going into the spring, uh, Barton kind of alluded to this with his talk uh, this morning earlier, you know, we really need to think about first thing, April, May, some of these plants might be the only thing that's available depending on uh, what happened during that, that actual grazing and growing season last year. So. Um, hopefully these uh, give you a little bit of an idea of what to be looking for. Um, I don't know if this is the right strategy, probably the absolute wrong thing to do during COVID, I guess, but I want to pass around um, some resources uh, for you to look at if you'd like. Uh, the first is a bulletin uh, from the USDA. It's kind of a quick guide, um, pretty easy to go through. Uh, the one guide that I did not bring today is a new one um, that's through a joint effort with Montana and Wyoming, um, but I'll give you the resource link for that. So um, we can pass that around. I'll let Rachel decide. She can be in charge if we, we get everybody sick, I guess. But uh, uh, the other one is a, a quick field guide. Um, it's called Field Guide to Poisonous Plants uh, to Livestock in the Western U.S. Um, it's really nice. Um, it's small. Um, the pictures are hand-drawn, so they're not actual photographs. Um, I like this one. It's a quick guide. It's not as detailed um, as this next one, which is a guide to plant poisoning of animals in North America. Um, so this one has a lot more detail, has some actual nice photographs. Um, it's going to go into a lot more detail about uh, what types of um, plants are out there, what exactly is causing, causing the poisoning, um, you know, and all those specific toxins that we have in there with those plants. So that's a good one as well. <clears throat> Lastly, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, part of the main focus with uh, poisonous plants is, is really understanding what we have out there. So going through, doing an evaluation, um, maybe there's new plants you're not familiar with, um, you know, being able to properly ID those plants is important. So um, I'm going to put up the website um, for the Rocky Mountain Herbarium. Um, so the herbarium is basically the top floor of the Ava Nelson building in Laramie. 
um, and they've got just these huge file cabinets full of plants. Well, they've got some, some money and they've decided to start digitizing all the plants. So on there, if you think, you know, hey, I, I think this plant might be what's on my property, you can actually go through there and it will give you all the locations that those plants have been collected. And then there's an actual photograph that you can zoom in, um, zoom out, and you can actually get some pretty good um, ID that way. Um, the other ones I'll include uh, will be the, the extension office where you can take a plant to. Uh, weed and Pest, you're Bob from Weed and Pest, right? Okay, uh, so if you don't know Bob, Bob can raise his hand. Um, he's really great at plant ID as well. So, um, so that's part of the battle with this. So um, the other one, this is basically every plant that we have here in Wyoming. Um, it's Vascular Plants in Wyoming uh, by Robert Dorn. Um, so that's another good one as well. There's not pictures, so if you're a picture person, um, don't use that one unless you need to look at it and fall asleep uh, right before bed because it's so cold. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so why care about this? Uh, you know, some recent estimates, um, you know, from the most recent data we have is probably poisonous plants are costing folks in the U.S. around $600 million a year. So, you know, it could be close, it could be more. Um, but there's a lot of different things that play into this, right? Um, there's just the economic loss of that animal to begin with. Um, sometimes we lose genetics. Um, you know, I think about one story when I was in northeast Wyoming, um, it involved sheep and dead camas. Uh, one of the producers I was working with, he had this story of how he got out of high school and he, he just wanted to become this great sheep producer. So he bought you know, four brand new rams. They were the rams that he really wanted to start his flock with. Um, he was on his dad's property and he kind of walked through the pasture but didn't walk through one section and left those rams out that night and went back the next morning and they were all dead. Uh, there was a section of death camas he did not see. They all ate the death camas, and so he had to start from scratch. So, um, so there's a lot of those things that are floating around. Um, so we don't always necessarily deal with poisonous plants or have issues, but um, they're there more often than we think. Um, there's a lot of new logistics that have to happen if we do find this. So we might have to think about herbicide control. Maybe we have to think about fencing things out. Uh, maybe it's a new grazing strategy. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. All those types of things. Uh, we might have to think about additional forage. Uh, there's a lot of things that play into that. Uh, there also might be pastures that we just can't graze that year, uh, so that can be a huge economic uh, issue as well. Um, decreased land value. Uh, so if you go to sell a place and there's a lot of poisonous plants, obviously uh, you can't sell it for as much. Uh, increased medical bills. Uh, I think Tom Pryor might enjoy that, I guess, but uh, that's job security for other folks. Um, the other part of that is just emotional worry, right? Um, thinking about, gosh, what is out there um, and all those sorts of things. So here's kind of what we're going to cover today. Again, this is a fairly short list, uh, but hopefully you can look through these resources and we can go through and, and if you have other questions about other plants, we can talk about those later. Uh, but these are some of the ones that I tend to see a lot of issues with during drought situations. Uh, the first one is choke cherry. Uh, so I have a, an example of this. Um, I was called to a place in northeast Wyoming, and the mother cow and the calf were dead. And the vet said, you know, it's something definitely related to poisonous plants. They couldn't make it out, so I spent the entire afternoon looking for poisonous plants. Um, so this is a native plant, um, and I'll get to why they actually probably uh, came in contact us with it in just a minute, uh, but it's a native plant. Uh, we find it in a lot of our riparian areas, so it's very common. Uh, it's found throughout Wyoming, um, and if we have a moist area or around a water source, lots of times we can end up in choke cherry. Um, it actually is cyanide poisoning, that's the issue. Um, it affects all ruminants. Um, it's not that common, but today we kind of think a lot of, um, with a lot of these poisonous plants, you know, I'm not big into wine, but if you think about wine production, we generally think about grapes, right? What do they usually do with the grapes before they make wine? Mm -hmm. Ferment them. They also stress those plants a little bit, right? Get a little bit higher sugar content. So a lot of these plants, they might be okay at certain points of the year, but when they become stressed, uh, those plants can't function properly, so we end up with a lot of toxins sometimes that build up 
um, and can't be moved throughout that plant. So this is one of those where if we have um, you know, stress to that plant, um, damaged leaves, things have been getting beat up, this is where we tend to have issues with it. Um, Rachel, do you mind hitting the lights for just a second so we can try and view some of these? Um, so choke cherry, all right, Alex Malcolm, don't fall asleep. Um, so choke cherry has these nice white, um, beautiful blossoms in the spring. Um, it's characterized mainly by these teeth. This is called the margin or the perimeter of the leaf. So it has these nice little teeth here. Um, it also has two little glands right here on the, um, that's called the petiole, but that's part of the leaf that attaches to the branch. So this is a good way to help identify it. The other one that we have that's native that sometimes gets confused um, is actually really good forage for a lot of our native uh, wildlife uh, is service berry, but it has more of a, an oval or a circular type leaf. So this one's a little bit more um, elongated. So this is how we identify it. Um, and what happens with this is generally we become stressed in the fall. Um, it can't move those toxins throughout the plant. So what happened with that example was there was some choke cherries right by the water source. It was a really dry year. It was you know, August sometime. And essentially everything else was avoiding it, but evidently that mother cow uh, decided that it was something that was green and she wanted to eat. Uh, the calf probably followed suit and then they both ended up eating it and basically died right next to the water tank that we drank. So, um, so really paying attention to this one for identification is important for later in the year. Um, so what's tricky with this, um, or not tricky I guess, um, depending on how you look at it, um, the toxin must be consumed at one time. Um, so that's important to consider as well. You know, if they're sitting there um, stressed out, um, eating on it really fast, um, you might have things that happen right away. Um, but it's also important to remember that um, the ruminants are often more affected than the non-ruminants. Um, so it doesn't take a ton. Um, another problem plant, I haven't included it here because it's not as big of an issue here for Fremont County. It is where I live in Laramie. Uh, it's arrowgrass, it behaves in a similar way. Um, so, you know, for a 400 pound, uh, you know, calf probably, didn't have cow there, calf, um, it's about one pound of leaves is what it's going to take um, for it to be fatal. So um, depending on how, how big that animal is, we're going to get into some of those details in a bit. Um, you know, things can happen quite quickly. So if we think about that, that mother cow and her calf, it probably wasn't quite as much that we had to think about for that calf to consume compared to the mother. Okay, some of cause nitrate poisoning. Um, so I put these up here, um, not because these are what a lot of animals are probably seeking out to consume all the time, uh, but these tend to be some of those that are around the edges of fields. Lots of times they get chopped up into hay. Um, if we're doing a management intensive grazing with some electric fence or something like that, sometimes we're forcing those animals to eat um, plants that are there that they might not normally consume, right? Um, so I think Canada thistle is a good example of that. Um, you know, we kind of have those nice flowers. Um, you know, we do have animals that tend to eat those. Um, so where we end up with a lot of issues, especially with the Canada thistle, is on the edge of fields, um, where maybe we've been fertilizing, um, so there's usually some excess nitrogen, for example. Um, they're really competitive for nitrogen, uh, the Canada thistle is. So if we end up, you know, again, disturbing that plant, it's uh, towards the end of the year, they're under stress, um, it can even happen with cloudy days sometimes, um, we can end up with some excess nitrogen and then we end up with some nitrate uh, poisoning issues there. Um, these are all three weeds, so Bob is probably out there every day trying to hopefully get rid of these, uh, but we see these pop up a lot. Um, so I add these because they're really adaptive um, they've done some really interesting things with Russian thistle as to when it can germinate. Basically, you can do it as soon as the soil um, thaws out, all the way up to like 100 some degrees. So it's really adaptable. Um, these things tend to pop up in a lot of areas. So again, not a huge issue um, for a nice uh, rangeland that we have, but we tend to see these around the edge of the fields um, where they end up getting cut up into hay and different things like that. So Brian, are these a problem 
both both uh, cut in hay and cut in yeah. grain uh, candy? They can be, yeah. Um, usually it's when they're standing is the worst. Um, they would have to consume a lot of it generally when it's cut into hay. Um, but yeah, we generally try to have not enough or not too much in the hay. You know, the other part with hay, is that Dave? Mm -hmm. Okay, it is. Um, is, you know, usually they can kind of pick it out a little bit later, but um, if it's been chopped up at all, then they end up consuming more than they need to. So, um, so yeah, great question. Um, so here's some more um, as far as numbers, if you're, if you're into that. Um, so again, um, you know, it's about 0.05% uh, of the body weight. Um, so if you think about a, a 1,200-pound uh, cow, um, so it's a little over half a pound that they'd have to consume. So really it's not, um, you know, something that's really high in nitrates. Um, it doesn't take a lot of it. Uh, we tend to see a lot of this issue as well with some of our forage crops, of, such as oats and other things like that as well. So if you ever have issues with it, uh, you can do testing, which is great. Um, I have most of the folks in Southeast send them to Ward Labs out of Carney, Nebraska, and they do a great job for, for testing for that. So um, <clears throat> something to keep in mind. Um, again, generally not a huge issue that we run into, um, but if you are feeding a lot of those types of forages, uh, just keep heads up. So again, Canada thistle has kind of these uh, somewhat nice purple flowers in the spring. Uh, this is a good way to identify it earlier in the spring. Uh, we just have basically the, the leaf that's popping up there. Russian thistle, they kind of tend to have a reddish purple stem. Uh, these finer leaves, once they mature, they become really pokey. So that's generally not what animals are going to be consuming them. Uh, kochia is another one that we just talked about. Uh, it has a little bit wider leaf. Again, generally something that things aren't seeking out, but when it's cut up into hay, that's where we can have those issues. Um, both Russian thistle and Canada, Russian thistle and kochia will tend to be in a lot drier sites. Um, you know, so that's where if you're on the very edge of a field, you know, things are getting irrigated and they're not, that's where we tend to have those plants pop up. Um, so this is a little bit more um, for those that might be interested on exactly what happens. Um, again, all of this, we're not gonna focus as much today, um, but I just wanted to include this slide because if you're curious about how these all work, um, that last book that we had, the, the guide to, to plant poisoning, this is the guide that will help you kind of understand a lot of that information a little bit better. So, um, so this, is, this is what happens except essentially. Um, I kind of also wanted to put this up here for those of you who are raising sheep. Um, sheep don't have as much uh, methoglobin as, as much as cattle, so they tend to be a little bit more resistant. So um, lots of times you'll see sheep in some of these scenarios that don't end up with issues, whereas cattle might. All right, um, here's some other plants. Uh, for those of us who are ready for spring, uh, we'll generally see these first thing. Uh, this is a sagebrush buttercup here. We have a lot of different um, varieties here in Wyoming, but we'll generally see these things right away in the spring. Um, so I put this plant up here because if we think about, um, you know, maybe we didn't have as much forage as we wanted last year, um, and then we're gonna throw some animals out onto either rangeland or pasture, and there's not a whole lot of forage available, um, we can end up with some, some pretty bad things happen. So here's kind of a typical range site. Um, we have some sagebrush and bitter brush and junipers in the back. Uh, we still have a fair amount of, of grass that's available. Uh, but as you can see, there's a lot of these nice bright yellow flowers that are sticking out there. So I, I put this up because, um, you know, I feel like in that scenario, we might be throwing some horses out there early in the spring, right? Uh, generally, they're pretty good at selecting um, what they eat. Um, but you know, with any type of animal, you know, if there's something green and we don't have a whole lot available from the last year, um, you know, they, they tend to try those new plants, right? So I, I want to uh, caution you on that one. The other thing is they're pretty low growing, right? Um, so there's not a whole lot of biomass there. But 
They're also really close to the ground, so if we are in a drought situation, lots of times they've already flowered, gone to seed, they're already there waiting for the next year to pop up. So um, they're one of those that are there for only probably a couple week window, um, but tend to, tend to be there. So uh, something else to keep in mind, um, it can cause some liver damage, which is probably the main issue that we're usually worried about. Um, again, some sensitivity to the sun, uh, but depending on the breed of animal or what, what we're looking at, um, sometimes that's not always a major issue. Uh, there's also burr buttercup. Have kind of these gnarly looking seed pods here. Um, generally, we tend to see these in waste areas, uh, but again, it's also poisonous. But where I see the, the concern issue and where um, I've suspected things in the past from talking to folks is probably from these native plants uh, that are out there. So, Barton alluded to this earlier. What are some other issues we might have in the spring, right? Um, you'll notice I didn't have these on my list. These are some of the most common ones that we have. Uh, so, this is the death camas. Um, these are the leaves of death camas early in the spring. So, lots of times we confuse it with just grass that's greening up or a sedge. It looks really familiar. And it's really hard to pick out. <clears throat> so this picture is actually from this same photo or the same area here. So I guess maybe I, I should sleep better at night, but maybe I'm, I'm worried about or being paranoid about the different plants that are out there, right? So looking at this, I'm going, geez, there's a lot of poisonous buttercups. There's death camas that's out there. And just looking at it from a distance, it's really hard to gauge what's out there, right? Um, so these are two major issues. Um, the other one is Larkspur. It kind of has these nice purple flowers with a spur on the end, which is easy to recognize later in the year. But with a lot of these early spring plants, um, and again, if we're in a drought situation, we don't have much forage available, we're really having to look for these leaves and how these plants might be, might be sticking up early in the spring. Um, I wish these were a little clearer for you, but um, I guess that goes to my lack of photography skills. Rachel, you probably got a name for photography, didn't you? I should add you to these. So uh, both of these are, are due to the, the alkaloids. Um, again, one of those issues, um, animals don't always necessarily notice when they're eating alkaloids and then tend to accumulate and eat a lot of those in their system. Um, boy, it's not coming out here. So um, this is a toxic window for uh, Larkspur. So as you can see, it's really toxic um, early in the spring. Um, we generally don't have good palatability, but if that's the only thing that's out there, lots of things tend to eat it. So, um, so early in the spring, it's really toxic. Things don't tend to eat it quite as much as they normally would. But once they start to flower, um, that's where we tend to see the most traditional issues with Larkspur. But I'm putting this up there for, you know, again, if we're only dealing with the leaves, uh, we need to be aware <laughs> that those things are out there. When does it flower, Brian, in Wyoming? Um, so it depends on the species, Dave. Um, <clears throat> so low larkspur, which is going to be in a lot of the, you know, our mid to low elevation sagebrush systems, is probably going to be end of May, uh, or uh, beginning of June for a lot of those, depending on where we're at. Um, as we start moving up in elevation, we can get all the way up to tall larkspur, which lots of times doesn't bloom until the middle of August, depending on where we're at. So, um, you know, depending on the year and where we're at, um, basically you can expect, you know, beginning the middle of June all the way through the middle of August. So, um, kind of makes it tough. Um, there's a lot of different species that are out there. And I guess the other paranoia for me is, you know, lots of times I talk about gardening to folks and what are some really common garden plants that we have, delphiniums, which are the same thing that people plant in their gardens. Not that those are escaping, but uh, um, definitely an issue as well if something were to, uh, to get into the flower beds. Um, okay, so this is the one um, that I probably have had, um, I guess, the biggest issues with. Um, it's not a very common poisonous plant. Um, but I've definitely seen some really bad things come with this plant. Um, it's not really listed as um, something that causes death, 
Okay, so it's more of a sensitivity to the sun. But where I've seen the, the, the issues has been with liver damage. So um, with this plant specifically, uh, there was a ranch outside of Laramie. I got this call, hey, we've had all these cattle dying and there's some liver issues happening. Um, we're not sure what plant it might be, but you know, could you come out and see if there's any sort of plant that you could you know, trace that might be causing liver issues. So, um, so I went out, we drove around all day, um, kind of looked at everything that was out there. Um, the site had probably been grazed a little too hard the previous year. It was a dry year, um, for Laramie at least. Um, there was not any green grass. It was later in August. Um, and what we had was um, basically, you know, yearlings that were out there. Um, they were new to the area. They'd just been brought in. Um, and what happened was essentially they were trying out new green plants, right? Uh, so we're going to talk about some of these management strategies at the end here. Uh, but what was happening was um, they kept consuming this and it kept building up in their system because they didn't have any other available forages. So um, hound's tongue is introduced. It's a biennial plant, so it means it puts up a rosette or leaf material the first part of the year. And then the second year, it actually produces a, a really nice flower. Um, and then it has these little sticky seeds that tend to stick in your boots and other things like that. So um, it's probably a good job security for Bob every year, whether he likes it or not. Um, but this is what I found. Um, essentially little bite marks out of every little plant. Um, so you can see it's dry, there's not really any grass. The other thing that's here is a little bit of yarrow, so this is actually in a wet area. But these plants are fairly drought resistant depending on what it's looking like for the year, right? So this is the, you know, the rosette that's left over. Um, and essentially they had a ton of hound's tongue, and this was the only thing that was green, and so those calves were going by and taking a little bit of bites out of every one. So every plant, you know, there was two to three leaves that looked like this, and essentially that they've been doing that for the past month or so, because it's been so dry. Um, it doesn't look like much, but it had built up enough that they ended up losing like 12 or 15, you know. Um, so not a good deal at all. Um, but this is one of those, if you're in a drought, you have this plant, I would really be cautious. So um, since that time, I've heard from other folks of similar issues in different parts of the, the state and in Montana. All right, selenium poison. Um, so this is one of my favorite fishing holes here in Laramie at Twin Buttes Reservoir. Um, and I guess I should have been fishing instead of taking pictures of plants, but uh, um, this is Princess Bloom here. Uh, so selenium is a fairly big issue uh, depending on where we're at. Um, so this is one of those, if we have some, some older soils, like some bad lands, some places like that on our property, this is where we probably have some potential selenium issues. Um, this is again one of those that tends to build up. Um, there's a kind of a fun read from the 70s of a professor who uh, you know, was really looking in at Custer's path um, as he was traveling around the west and has some theories as to how maybe his horses were accumulating selenium throughout his travels and where he was at, um, and how they probably weren't up to uh, you know, the health that they should have been. Uh, sounds like maybe just an excuse, but uh, it's kind of an interesting read. Um, it's one of those that uh, I feel like varies from year to year. So we've all probably gone from here to Rollins, right? Um, you know that Willow, so you go out on the big flats by Lamont, and then there's the hills as you go up Willow Hill there, right before you get to Rollins. There's the Mineral X Road on your right hand side. So that is like the prime spot to view some selenium soil. So this year probably won't be the best. Two years ago was really great. Um, so in that, during that time, there's a lot of woody aster, and there's a lot of princess bloom. So if there's enough precipitation, it's just beautiful on that hillside with both of these plants. So we know that there's a ton of selenium in that area, um, but the point to that is, you may not think you have selenium issues, but really try and look for these key indicator plants um, every year because that will hopefully give you some insight to what's there. 
So the issue is we have primary accumulators, um, which are several thousand parts per million uh, accumulation in their in their plant cells every year. Um, those are those are really bad, right? Um, most animals tend to ignore those, but where we end up with some other issues are these uh, secondary accumulators. So um, this even goes down into some of the grasses. So even though they generally don't accumulate a lot, um, they can, depending on the year, accumulate a fair amount of selenium. So um, I've had feed reps come to my office and say, hey, do you have a good um, soil map of selenium soils of Wyoming? And I say, no. Um, and basically their idea is they want to provide supplement to those folks who aren't in selenium problem areas, right? So um, selenium is um, a mineral that's needed by animals, but in too much we can end up with some major issues. Um, it ends up affecting their hair, their hooves, they, they lots of times can't function like they should, right? So we get decreased production. It's not necessarily one of those that causes sudden death, but as we look about production over time, for that animal, they're probably really going to taper off. Um, could be a major issue with, with horses as well. Um, so if you have some horses in an area, it's something to keep an eye on as well. They're just not, you know, in the health that you think they should be, it might be potentially something with one of these issues. So, um, so these are some of the um, milk fetches. These are some other native plants that not, aren't necessarily easy to identify, like the woody aster with the big white flowers, or the prince of plume with the big yellow flowers. But a lot of these tend to accumulate a lot. And then some of our other milk fetches accumulate some as well. So um, I've always had troubles identifying milk fetches. There's a ton in the state. Um, so I was with a pro one day and I said, Ernie, how do I identify these things? You know, I'm just struggling with this. And so luckily we were in front of pine leaf milk fetch and he said, well, here's a trick with this one. So he just grabbed it, put it between his fingers and then we could smell all the selenium that was in there. So, um, you know, this was um, on a wild horse ranch. So that's like, oh, that's probably not a good thing either um, for the amount of selenium that's there. Um, but these ones are found. Um, in, in Fremont County, um, two group milk fetch is very, very common. Um, alkaline milk fetch is not very common. Um, it is in some spots around Fremont County, um, but pine leaf is also found here as well. So um, these have kind of some nice um, you know, white to pink flowers. I'll show you here in a minute, um, but something to definitely keep an eye on if they might be in the area. All right, some secondary accumulators. Uh, this is over by bag, um, and that's where I've been getting a lot of these selenium pictures. Um, if we have some four-winged salt brush here, um, our state flower, right, uh, Indian paintbrush, some other common ones that accumulated, uh, toad flax, gumweed. Uh, these are some other native plants that we have every year. Um, and, you know, for us as humans, a lot of folks tend to like to eat toad flax. Um, but these are things that are there all the time, uh, just, just we want to keep an eye on them. Um, these might be a little bit more palatable, especially the salt brushes, the toad flaxes, and the milk fetches to a lot of our, a lot of our livestock and animals. So here's two groove milk, milk fetch. It's got these really nice purple flowers, some great leaves. It helps fix nitrogen. We see a lot of vetches that are used in forages. Um, Caitlin might have had some in her um, cover crops that she discussed, um, so it's another one that we need to look at. Okay, so this is kind of where it gets confusing, uh, potentially, is uh, we also have loco weed issues, right? So we have this word loco weed, we have the word milk fetches, and they kind of get interchanged. Um, so this causes a different set of issues. This is neurological issues. Um, and this is basically um, caused from a fungus. Um, it's caused from an endophyte, um, which grows on the plant. Um, the plant ends up being toxic at all plants, or all growth stages. So that's really important to remember as well. Um, so if we see these nice, beautiful pink to white flowers, we probably lots of times want to be thinking about either selenium issues or potentially some loco weed issues. Um, the loco weeds um, 
they're a different genus than the milk judges, even though they look very similar. Um, so I bring this up because then we can separate out whether it's maybe a selenium issue or maybe it's a local heat issue. Um, so there's a couple things uh, to remember with this. Local weeds tend to have um, a naked stalk. So I've got an example up here uh, of basically where we'll have leaf material at the bottom and then the stalk of the plant and then a flower. Uh, it's kind of a general rule of thumb. There's another part called looking for a, uh, a beet, a part of the flower, uh, which if you're interested, we can, we can get into that. That's kind of boring, but uh, <clears throat> that's the other way to separate those out. Um, we tend to see a lot of these. Again, we're gonna see these usually earlier in the year. So again, on these drier sites, if we're in an area that doesn't receive a lot of precipitation, uh, these plants are probably going to be prominent for the most part. Uh, so we need to keep an eye out for these as well. Um, so again, here's some milk fetches. Um, again, the naked stock there. Um, this is Vesia, I don't remember the common name of this one, but this was uh, taken up by Dubois. Um, and then we have a lot of other uh, native loco weeds uh, that look just like that. Um, the picture of the one book, um, that's what's pictured because Thomas Nuttall, as he took a covered wagon across Wyoming, that's one of the plants he named, um, and he called it an endemic to Wyoming. So um, they're very common. Again, not a huge issue if there's extra available forage, but something to keep an eye on. Okay, um, so the last couple of minutes, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about some management strategies, some different thoughts. Um, hopefully I haven't bored you completely with the plant ID. But there's definitely a lot of things to cons consider when we're thinking about poisonous plants, right? Uh, overall, we want to think about, you know, what's the, what's the animal's health going into the grazing season, right? Have, have they been stressed throughout the winter? Is the body condition score way down because they haven't received enough? Um, if they're really not in good health, then they're probably more susceptible to some of these, these issues. Um, we hear a lot if you look, or I guess, you can read a lot about um, issues with plant with animals that have been shipped or stressed during moving. So um, if we dump animals out of the back of a truck onto a new pasture they're not familiar with, we want them to get to the far end of the pasture, um, that's where we can <clears throat> tend to see some issues. So lots of times you hear stories of um, you know, sheep in southeast or southwest Wyoming that get dumped out, they get moved through too fast with like, um, you know, horse brush or something like that, they end up with a called uh, big head. Um, you know, there's a lot of these things where if we end up rushing animals and try to take bites of stuff as they're moving along because they're hungry, right? And then we can end up with some issues that way. So um, a little bit of time and patience is probably really important if there are some poisonous plants there. Um, age and gender of animals. Um, you know, when I was in the Black Hills, uh, ponderosa pine was a major issue, but if I was worried about running bulls, would it be an issue? No, because it just causes abortion in females, right? So um, some of these animals, um, depending on their gender, are affected differently um, than others. So there's some good work happening out of Utah State, looking at the gender differences with Larkspur, um, which is kind of interesting. They're looking at age, and then they're looking at gender, um, looks like maybe steers are perhaps a little bit better adapted to larkspur than, than uh, heifers or cows. So um, it's one of those things we can kind of just keep learning about. Um, thinking about the breed, uh, so with those calves that were dying outside of Laramie from hound's tongue, they weren't exhibiting any issues with really sunburn or other things like that because they were black Angus. Um, so, but maybe if we had something with some white skin, maybe we would have seen something that was happening there. Um, the other thing, again, going back to what Barton talked about this morning, you know, what's our range condition looking like? Are there lots of good choices or bad choices? Um, you know, are there good choices that they want to eat or we're having to make bad choices? Um, doing some sort of evaluation throughout there is really important. I understand that it's hard to gauge what's all out there. Um, but trying to do some sort of walkthrough, uh, drive through, whatever you can do is really important. Um, water is really important, right? Now, if the animals are stressed,
rest. Um, lots of times, you know, it's going to hit them a lot harder. Um, water helps, you know, their bodies process everything better as well. So quality water is really important, um, especially we start thinking about nitrate issues, right? Making sure that our water doesn't have a lot of nitrates uh, can compound an issue there. Um, <coughs> talk about good, bad choices. Um, are they familiar with the pasture? Um, so I think about the example south of Laramie. They were not. Um, that was not a good deal. <coughs> are min minerals provided, right? Um, are they lacking protein or other issues during a dry year? So is that why they're seeking out these new plants to try because they're higher in protein? Um, that's always something else to really keep in mind. Um, the other part, you know, you talked a little bit about, Dave, was, um, you know, was it going to be paid at some point? Um, thinking about that is really important as well. Uh, yellow sweet clover was another plant I had to deal with a lot. In northeast Wyoming, it was everywhere. Uh, people hated a lot. Um, and it wasn't necessarily that the plant itself is poisonous, but there's a uh, mold that will grow on it that causes the plant to be um, poisonous. So uh, thinking about these types of forages, it's great to be consumed that way, but something like that where it gets dried out, and if it's not taken care of, we can end up with further issues. Um, so these are kind of my, my thoughts for pasture management. Scout everything out. Um, you know, if there are a few plants or there are just a few, you know, what are we willing to work with? Is there enough to eat? Um, what about if we spray them? Uh, why should we be worried about throwing animals on their pasture if we just sprayed with herbicide? So a lot of our, our, a lot of our herbicides tend to be salts. So those animals will actually go out and look for some of those salts. Um, so if we end up spraying a bunch of hound's tongue, and spray them with the herbicide and we don't give it enough time, uh, animals might actually be seeking them out just for the salt that's on there. So the other part of that is we also stress a lot of plants with that. So not only are they seeking out the salt, but that plant is stressed as well, so it probably is accumulating more toxins. Um, what's the stress look like? Again, uh, that Canada thistle example, if it's early in the spring, I'm probably less worried about it. Uh, but in a dry year, and I've got a bunch of Canada thistle right by a water, um, I'd be really, really worried about that and probably try and get rid of it. Um, you know, think about climatic events. Um, is there going to be a big spring snowstorm or a big fall snowstorm where that's all that's available? Are those leftover green plants? Um, and then finally, you know, what can we think about as far as stocking rate, electric fence, different things to hopefully avoid uh, plants from seeing it? So I'll end with this. Um, Again, this is close to where all the selenium issues were, uh, down by bag. Um, but just thinking about what your pasture looked like, um, have you been through it in a long time, where are animals hanging out? Um, are they hanging out in other places where there's less poisonous plants? Are they where there's a lot? Um, so I'll just kind of end on this to have you think about your own, your own pasture, your own system, where you might be, and how these plants might be affected. Um, and then these are some of the resources that are out there. Um, the last one I'll um, point out is a new one. Um, it's found at the University of Wyoming Extension website, and it's poisonous plants uh, for Wyoming and Montana. So it's a really great one. It doesn't necessarily go into the plant ID, but more the management that's out there and those sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, Again, here's all my contact information. If you ever have any questions or just want to harass me, um, feel free to give me a call or an email. So, um, yeah, is there any other questions? I think we're just about at the end of our time. Alex is giving me the head shake. If you do, feel free to grab me out in the hall or anything like that. So, enjoy the rest of the farm and ranch. Day.